pleasing to you, O Lord our God. The scripture lesson is referred to as the Beatitudes. And in our series of thinking, in those two columns of who God is and how we represent that, we look at the Beatitudes. To see God's beauty and to show it means all of these things. But I'm going to focus today on one of the things that made our list together, which is peace. Peace. God is our peace. God is peace. And if you could look at the bigger picture for just a moment, sort of stepping back and looking at God and humanity, you might start at the garden where God had a garden and he had two of his creation given instructions, and yet they did something to rebel. They broke the peace. There was sort of a relationship set up that would now be forever changed and would turn God from not just peaceable, but to peacemaker, peace pursuer person lover. As God is our peace, we are called to be peacemakers in this section of Matthew 5, in this teaching that Jesus gives, which goes on far beyond the Beatitudes. We even get into sections regarding the followers of Christ being, being called the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You see, it's this peace, it's this beauty that is God that projected through us becomes something that has flavor. It becomes something that's attractive and illumines the world. It gives us a certain radiance. And in this theme of beautifying ourselves as Christ's children, we might have to take a salt bath. We might need to put on something that makes us a little bit more vibrant. Always cracks me up, though, when I see these beauty stores or even commercials. I mean, the number of products now. What, what is it, like Sephora, I think it is, it's in the Bridgewater Mall, and I walk past there, and there must be 10,000 products in that store, as I look, right? And we all buy into it. Now, you know, that's a whole other conversation as to what's valid and what's not. But, wow, we are so concerned about making ourselves beautiful, and yet those things, of course, are superficial and temporary. But peace and peacemaking intersects with eternal. I love how this peacemaking theme is intertwined with the commands that Jesus said when he responded to the lawyer. We love God first, and then our love for God reminds us of how much God loves us. The grace that we need, the grace that we receive, and then it does something in us and into the world. But it's from God first. <clears throat> so today as we turn our thoughts on to how to be peacemakers, I want to remind us that our love for God is at the heart of being peacemakers. Unless we have that love for God, our peacemaking is done out of our own abilities. And the reality is that we can't even be at peace with God based on our own abilities, let alone other people. And I also want to caution you that living peaceably doesn't mean that we remain in abusive situations 
And it doesn't mean that we remain or go into an impure state. Because the challenge could be that if I'm going to live at peace with people, sometimes that means I go along. In fact, if you look at the rest of the Beatitudes, the very next statements are that you're going to be persecuted. And you're blessed for that too. Jesus has the understanding that right, he came both to bring peace, but to bring the sword. Actually, he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring the sword. There's a certain understanding that Jesus has that living and pursuing peace does not mean everything is going to be perfect. But think about what God did to give peace within us. To say that he would give his right arm is an understatement. Jesus gave his life. Jesus was mocked and tortured. He exhausted himself. He took spikes in his hands and in his feet. And eventually he suffocated, giving all of his very breath so that we could be at peace with God. What do we give up to be at peace with others? Sometimes there is something that has to be given up. When we think of peacemaking, we think of how we're going to make everything right and everyone's going to feel good. It didn't feel good for Jesus. Didn't Jesus know, though, of all the political issues that were going on around his world? Didn't Jesus know of the social issues when he preached this sermon? And yet, he calls for peacemaking. Jesus addresses bigger issues by addressing the individual. He says to them, first and foremost, be pure. He's talking about something that starts in that relationship with God, and it's all about being pure. If you look at the Beatitudes and you go through them, there's something about the humility and purity, uh, that state of being that sets us in the right place to be peacemakers. And it's not the same as being a deal maker, a deal broker. It's not just figuring out how to agree and disagree. It's even more. There's something that's even spiritual. Let me tell you about something that's not spiritual. We are all probably bombarded in a sense on talk shows and Dr. So-and-so that's going to tell you some advice on how to get along with each other, how to have a peaceful relationship, how to make your marriages last, how to have great collegial uh, relationships that are, that are long-lasting and help you to be successful, uh, how to succeed as a student in school, and all these things about how to get along with one another. Here, I'll just give you four, four points from one such source about how to be at peace in your relationship, how to have successful relationships. Be curious, not critical. And you evaluate these. Oh, I see somebody brought me some water. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll probably get through this one and the other two. Be curious and not critical. Be careful, not crushing. Ask, don't assume, which means that you're going to have to have courageous conversations. And connect before you correct. And in a relationship that's a loving relationship, this helps you keep from losing the magic. Now, don't those four things sound great? They, they do. I, I admit it. They do. I think that's the next thing that Jesus said, right? Be curious. No, he didn't, right? Why didn't Jesus say this? Why didn't Jesus tell us more practically how to be peacemakers? I'm kind of upset with Jesus about all the answers that he didn't give me on how to live in my world today. Now, that's not really true. I'm not really upset with Jesus. The reality is I have to readjust my expectation of what Jesus is doing. He's addressing something in a way that I don't want to be addressed sometimes. I readjust. I adjust myself to who God is. Be curious, not critical. Fantastic. Careful, not crushing. Ask, don't 
don't assume and connect before you correct. I love it. But that's not what Jesus says. Now, I bet I could go throughout Scripture and find Scriptures that will support these things. That's not how I'm going to preach a sermon to you. From the Beatitudes, we get a very different message. And from the entire sermon that Jesus gives, there's an element in there that shows us what it is to have a peacemaking relationship. Before I go any further, though, let me just address some things here. 50% of marriages end in divorce in uh, secular marriages, non-Christian marriages. Um, so you know, of course, the percent in Christian marriages, right? About the same thing. Right? There's, I don't know. Is that saying that we're not salty enough? I don't know. Two, two means, I guess you could take it back. Maybe we're too salty. Uh, a 2016 Mental Health Foundation did, a, did some research and, and published some, some article about um, uh, quality relationships. And basically the conclusion was that quality, a lack of quality relationship is killing, uh, is killing people uh, at a higher rate than obesity and the lack of exercise. So there's a need for peacemaking. In marital relationships, family relationships, in our friendships, with our colleagues, fellow students, and things like that. And it, peacemaking goes beyond whether or not I'm supposed to put the toilet seat up or down. And it goes beyond whether or not my, my work area is clean enough or those kinds of things. Or if I vacuumed or did my laundry and uh, all of those things, peacemaking certainly involves those things, but it's beyond that too. So, why is this important? Is it just that Jesus called us to be peacemakers or said that you're blessed if you are? I want to mention at least a couple of things. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. What if you're not a child of God? Is it possible that those in our church, those that hear my sermons, my messages, join us in the hymns and the praise songs that we sing, is it possible that there's anyone among us that's going to be labeled as not a child of God, something other than child of God? Is that possible? Yes. Is it possible that you or I are that? God forbid. In one sense, we stand in faith and say, no, we are God's children and nothing can snatch us out of God's hand. That's what scripture says. And yet we know that if this is the behavior of a child of God, I know that I mess that up. I know that I see others mess it up and talk to me about that. We can mess it up. Can we rest in God's grace? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that we stay there. Paul addresses that so many times. We are pursuing perfection, right? The word says that not all those who call me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talks about it being a narrow way. And other than the narrow way, there's the wide gate, right? There's a wide path for the, that leads to destruction. But Jesus addresses peacemaking, first and foremost, as a mission that begins with purity. Purity has to do with us and the Lord. It also has to do with us and others. But there's something about having, hallowed be thy name, which, is, by the way, is in this section, Jesus' prayer, when he teaches. In fact, this whole section, you can pull out different pieces here and there, and out of context, it's going to appear like it's addressing something that it's not. But this section is talking about how we deal with each other. 
Read it. Read the whole section, the red letter print there, and you're going to see that as he's talking about salt and light, as he's talking about divorce and all the things that come into play, he's talking about us together in relation. And it begins with purity and humility. Now, I mentioned I was going to have two reasons that this was important, among many. Romans 12, 18. Paul says that as far as it is possible, it's almost like he recognizes right away, not everybody's going to achieve this. Not everybody's going to let it happen. Live peaceably with one another. And so, all those that you have a relationship with, you have a responsibility. To be peacemakers means that we are builders. Peacemaking doesn't mean that it's just going to happen to us. It's just going to happen. We have to be a part of the making process. But we're building something that we can't possibly build on our own. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds of the potential situations where you can feel abused when you are a peacemaker. But I do want to talk a little bit about it because it is so applicable to so many people who internalize that call to be meek. It can feel like abuse to fall on your sword in making peace with other people. Sometimes falling on your sword is actually falling on the cross. The sacrifice, the burden of carrying the cross may show up in the form of losing some pride. Pride being surrendered always hurts, especially when you are not wrong, per se. Especially when they are in the wrong, or wrong too. But humility owns our own issues and maybe even the issues of others. And that's a hard conversation to have. How could we possibly own someone else's faults? And I think there's room to have that conversation too. Taking up the cross may not just be for your own sin, but just like Jesus did, to take it up to be at peace with others when you've done nothing wrong. That is truly taking up the cross. That is to give up something that none of us want to give up. Being right. Being in the right. Being the good one. With, it carries, with that thought we carry pride. Being a peacemaker means letting others off the hook sometimes, at least when it won't hurt others, or making the hook as gentle as possible when you can't let someone off the hook. I realize that this theme of being a peacemaker is well beyond a sermon this morning. And so, I'm going to try to push it all into some words. I like the words peacemaker, and I like that interpretation. It means that we're building something. It reminds me of being a bridge builder. And as I thought through it, I started to jot some things down before I knew it. I had this huge list of comparable statements that represent what it is to be a peacemaker and probably even more that represent what it's to be on the other side of it, to not be a peacemaker. The peacemaker addresses the world as a chip off the block. You know this saying, right? You're sort of like those that you came from. I'm, I'm like my dad, I'm a chip off the block. The peacemaker addresses the world as a chip off the block. With grace, their attitude reflects the statement, 
What makes me any better than anyone else? A conflict cultivator, on the other hand, addresses the world with a chip on their shoulder, with veiled bitterness that's represented by the sentiment, what makes you so much better than me? A peace preventer is more than a conflict causer. They're opinion owners, complaint commentators, error analysts, troublemakers, sides finders, secret seekers, gossipy gloaters, grudge getters and keepers, talk abouters, but not talk toers. They're power seekers, and pride producers, and person reducers. Forgiveness revokers, weakness revealers, and failure revelers. They're jail keepers, prisoner pursuers, and gate guardians. They're relationship breakers, emotion takers. They're even secret haters. They're fire stokers, fault finders, and hell raisers. They're hurdle holders, hypocrite criers, and sorry snarlers. Peacemakers, though, are gentle giants, grace receivers and grace givers, hope holders and possibility pursuers. They are fault forgivers, pride releasers and patient passers. They're bridge builders, sacrifice makers, cross takers. They are people seers, enemy prayers, and God lovers. When Jesus challenges them to be peacemakers, what does he tell them to pray? How will be your name? Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What else does he instruct them to pray? First it was praise God, right out of the gate, hallowed. What else? Does he ever tell us how to pray about the people that we have trouble keeping peace with? Yes, he does. Pray for those that persecute you. Pray for your enemy, he says. I don't like to put people into that category as enemies, but some people tend to want to do that for themselves. And the reality is that when we are having trouble making peace, we had better make sure that we are people of prayer. And so instead of giving you four approaches to making peace that people in the world can make up, I'm going to give you the two that I believe Jesus will defend today. Start with purity. Make yourself right with God, and then pray for that person. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're calling for God to make justice happen, aren't we? We're calling on God to do something that we can't do. We can try with our words all that we might, but God builds the bridges with us. We use His resources. Have you ever seen a bridge being built? It's fascinating, isn't it? It's just amazing to me when they get out there and the two sides are both going out further and further and you're just, it's mind-boggling, depending on the bridge type, of course. Some of them are built like that, really, but even suspension bridges, even, they are, in a way, even though the, the cables go out first. But can you imagine, I'm sure as you've seen those things being built, there's a, something that's sort of daunting and scary. Because there's a, there's a danger to trying to build that bridge over that crevasse, over that water, over that scary thing. The point I'm making is that it takes great courage to be a bridge builder. And I would love to say that I have courage today to do it. And I know that I'm not a great bridge builder. I love to build, build the bridge and make the plans and do all the things. But guess what? I sort of give up a lot of times. I just, I say, you know what? I'm doing my part. I'm thinking right. I'm pure with God. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put myself out 
there. I'm, I'm trying to be humble and apologize for my part. But if they're not coming, I, you know what? I can't. I need to be more pushy. I need to push people. Why? Why do I need to push people to come along and walk across the bridge with me? So that we can show them how to be children of God. Peacemakers are children of God. We tend to think in very individualized terms. Maybe that's the result of our upbringing in this country. Maybe it's a result of some theology. But we're in it together. And together we are salt and light. So today we are challenged to examine the issues and the things that are division makers, the beliefs, the opinions, the values. We look at them. Are they temporary? Are they permanent? Are they opinions or are they truth? Let's put our effort. Let's go to war over the things that are permanent, over the things that are truth. Amen.